In this comic book is a love story, a boy and girl in love. They get married, and after an offensively lurid description, illustrated, of course, of the couple's wedding night, the book shows how the bride murders her husband by chopping his head off with an axe. This comic book describes a sexual aberration so shocking that I couldn't mention even the scientific term on television. I think there ought to be a law against them. Tonight I'm going to show you why. I love horror comics. I have always been fascinated by so-called trash media like pulp novels and comics that were meant to be read and then thrown away when one was done reading them. To me, horror books are emblematic of what the comic experience should be like. They were printed on newspaper because you were literally just supposed to throw them away when you were done reading them, like you did with the regular paper every day. It was what was expected. Comics were never initially intended to be fetishized and kept in clear plastic with cardboard backings, and hidden away in a long box somewhere in the closet or basement. And there's something to that idea that fascinates me, art that was designed for one-time use. I feel like most of us grew up watching The Crypt Keeper on HBO. If you were around my age and you didn't watch Tales from the Crypt, you at least knew what it was. But before I ever watched the show, I remember being a small child in 1995 and being absolutely terrified by a cheap Halloween animatronic of the Crypt Keeper outside of the Spencers and my local mall. I made my parents walk on the other side of the row of stores so that we didn't even have to walk near it. To me, it held power. That and a giant animatronic T-Rex head coming out of a building in Gatlinburg, Tennessee are two of my earliest memories of true fear of the supernatural. And as silly as it sounds, for a while, as a small child, the Crypt Keeper to me was synonymous with pure, unadulterated fear. He was the embodiment of the beyond, something that I had clear evidence of existing but was also at the same time entirely past understanding. I didn't know of his comic book origins for a long time. One of the first comics I ever read when I was growing up came in this anthology of previously published stories edited by R.L. Stein. I was so young at the time that I wasn't even really aware that Stein didn't write these tales himself. I don't remember a ton about this book aside from the fact that I loved it. I haven't held it in my hands since sometime in elementary school, but I do remember one thing in particular about it. It was a reprint from The Vault of Horror, issue 29, a story called A Sock for Christmas. The tale is introduced by what I at the time probably thought was Santa, but I remember being immediately put off by this image. He didn't look right and he tells of a castle in a long lost time and a faraway land. The young Prince Tarby has never known the definition of discipline. He ruins the clothes of the Prime Minister as a prank, and for this he faces no repercussions. The King rides into town one day and finds a boy, the local baker's son, that he decides to take and live at the castle to be the companion of his son, the Prince. The father, distraught by the idea of losing his youngest child, asks the King if he will ever see his son again to which the king responds that he will be able to see him again on Christmas Day each year. And from that day, any time that the young prince does something that he should not have done, the baker's son from the village is the one who is whipped to try and teach the prince a lesson, which obviously does not work. As summer turns into fall and fall turns into winter, the child dreams of the day that he will see his parents again. He imagines a Christmas morning where he and his siblings wake to find their stockings overflowing with presents. To this, the prince torments him, telling him that Santa does not bring gifts to the bad children, and that he has been whipped so many times that it would be impossible for him to receive any Christmas gifts. On Christmas Eve, the boy is returned to his family, and he tells his parents of how he has been treated since the spring, and he tells them how sad he is, that he has been so bad that he will be passed over that night by Santa Claus. The father, enraged by this, tells his son that Santa will indeed be coming that night, and for him to hang his stockings by the fire, in the stormy darkness of the night, the father rides to the castle, and he demands the king provide the family gifts in compensation of how their son has been treated. 
to which the king merely laughs. But by their bed in the morning, a letter is found that reads, Merry Christmas, Melvin. Since you were the prince's whipping boy, you deserve his presence. And there's one for your daddy too, just what he asked for. Signed, Santa Claus. Around the tree are a bounty of wrapped colorful gifts, and hanging by the hearth is the dripping sock that has been filled with the king, piece by piece. Horror was born out of the short story. For hundreds of years, horror has been a strong part of the literary tradition. And while today, when we hear the word literature, we think of the novel, that was not always the case. The short story has its roots deep in the soils of old mythology, folk tales, fables, anecdotes, and legends. From the likes of Homer's Odyssey to The 1001 Nights, and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the medium was born. And even though in the 1970s the horror novel overtook the literary horror genre and has mostly held on to it ever since, it has to be stated that for a time the short story was the main delivery method for horror in print, and that the masters of the genre either started their career or made significant work within short stories. From people like Nikolai Gogol to Ambrose Bierce, Charles Dickens, Edgar Allan Poe, Amelia Edwards, Algernon Blackwood, Shirley Jackson, Robert W. Chambers, H.P. Lovecraft, Daphne du Maurier, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Stephen King, Joyce Carol Oates, Harlan Ellison, Edith Wharton, Roald Dahl, Robert Eichmann, Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Clive Barker, Flannery O'Connor, Ramsey Campbell, and many, many others. The chain can be traced hundreds if not thousands of years, from the tale of Perseus and Medusa to Victorian ghost stories all the way up to the creepypastas of the internet today. Humans have always enjoyed telling each other spooky stories around the fire. And as a part of this tradition, it only makes sense that the first horror comic book, titled Eerie, was a collection of short pieces brought together in a collaborative fashion by different authors and artists. Eyes of the Tiger was the first story to appear, which tells of a man attempting to raise vegetarian tigers as pets. They come after him after getting their first taste of blood. Dead Man's Tale was next, which is about a man who murders a bum for a bottle of magic juice that he claims was given to him by a Native American. When drunk, the bottle gives a wish per sip, but if the drink ever runs dry, then the owner of the bottle will die. The Man-Eating Lizards that tells of an American bomber plane that loses course and crashes near a strange island. Goofy Ghost, a funny story about a ghost being sent out on his first haunting assignment, only to be scared away before he can actually begin. Proof, an illustrated prose short story about a woman who leaves her doors open every night, even on winter evenings, after being driven mad by the death of her husband and son in hopes that they will return to her. Mystery on Murder Manor, which finds two boys in a haunted house with a madman who believes himself to be a pirate protecting his chest of gold that in reality only turns out to be small rocks and seashells. And the strange case of Henpecked Henry, which is about a man who goes to work all day and comes home to his verbally and physically abusive wife. She yells at him day after day and he is slowly driven insane by the prison of his life that he finds himself trapped within, until one day he's had enough of it all and pushes her in front of a speeding train, only to then be haunted by her vengeful ghost. And what I love about this comic is that it is a document of history that you can see the life of the times within its pages. The Man-Eating Lizards is a World War II horror comic published not long after the actual events of World War II, and serves as a post-war reaction of what was going on in the world. Miss Broman's husband and son's death and proof is senseless, and is what drives her mad alone in her house, unable to make an unreasonable thing seem reasonable in her mind and can serve as a commentary on the lives of many women at the time, leaving their doors and hearts open for loved ones doomed to never return from that war. Mr. Horton's wife's abusive behavior towards him is a manifestation of a real growing fear among men at the time of losing their place as the head of the nuclear family, as well as their control over their wives. As women gained higher positions and responsibilities within that 1947 post-war American society, He's made to be a fool within his own home and is emasculated to the point of being driven to murder. Within these 1940s pages, you can see a snapshot of the anxiety of a decade. The fears and culture boil down to a digestible pamphlet that even a child could understand. You can see the fashion of the era, the ideals both good and bad, 
A southerner defends himself with the bust of Robert E. Lee, exclaiming, Here's the kind of southern hospitality we dish out to the likes of you. A wife takes total control over the life of her husband even from beyond the grave. Native American magic is used in a stereotypical way, and the Native Islanders who take the Americans captive are referred to as savages. The last page of The Man-Eating Lizards is to me one of the most interesting and shocking in all of comics in this time, as it is essentially advocating that a genocidal approach should have been taken in the war in the Pacific. After escaping the local village and taking two of the local women with them in their escape boat to share, one of the Americans says to the other, the report I'm making when we get back to base. A lot of barbarism to wipe out and a lot of lizard hunting to do before this Pacific Ocean is really peaceful. The comic ends with the narrator telling us in the last panel that Sam and Mike reach their base a few days later. A bomber squadron makes short work of the island's savage, bloodthirsty inhabitants. And now the island lies peacefully on the vast Pacific. This is punctuated by an advertisement in the back of the comic aimed at boys, where for just one dollar, they too can get their own atom bomb jacket patch. The horror genre breeds artistic creativity, and that is on show in this earliest of horror comics. Objects occasionally break the border of the panels, such as this hat here, which while very common today was an experimental technique at the time. As you can see by looking at these contemporary pages from the period from other more mainstream superhero comics, that the layouts were very simple in design, and the borders of panels were firm. This panel of Mr. Horton walking into the movies past the poster for Battle starring Humphrey Bogart is the moment where he decides what he's going to do with his wife later on, and is emblematic of the storytelling technique that Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons would later use in Watchmen to revolutionize the medium of comics nearly 40 years later by utilizing dramatic framing, lighting, and background props to add authorial commentary on the story as it unfolds. Adventures into the Unknown in 1948 would be the first comic that took this idea and ran with it on a monthly plan. It was one of the only horror comics from this time that would survive through the 1950s and actually make it into 1967, a shockingly good run for a book like this. Some of the earliest covers in Adventures into the Unknown's run are among the best of this era of comic books, with my favorite being this one of the capsized boat with the giant hands emerging from the water. The very first page of the first issue addressed the standing that the comic had among the history of horror as it reads, To our readers, superstition is ignorance. It's a part of the dark ages from which man emerged centuries ago. But great classical authors such as Edgar Allan Poe, Horace Walpole, and many others have done much to keep alive the tradition of the ghost story. And to this day, tales of the mysterious unknown still grip our imaginations. This, despite the fact that there are no such thing as ghosts. There never were and never will be. Yet, since stories of the supernatural will live forever, we invite you to enjoy the following Adventures into the Unknown. And in that same mindset of connecting horror comics to horror short stories, for the first issue, all stories included were scripted by the legendary horror short story author Frank Belknap Long, who wrote over 30 novels and 11 short story collections. He was the kind of guy that was in the midst of everything in literary genre writing at the time. He was a very close friend of H.P. Lovecraft and would later write biographies about him. And Ray Bradbury would at one point describe him by saying, Frank Belknap Long has lived through a major part of science fiction history in the US, has known more of the writers personally or has corresponded with them, and has, with his own writing, helped shape the field when most of us were still in our early teens. And the benefit of bringing Long into this added legitimacy to the magazine. It added a tangible connection to history within the genre. The first issue was packed with content with fun stories like The Living Ghost, The Werewolf Stalks, Haunted House, True Ghost Stories of History, The Castle of Otranto, It Walked by Night, Strange Spirits, and The Cursed Pistol, each rendered beautifully by artist Fred Gardner. Adventures into the Unknown is important as a comic because it took what Eerie started and ran with that concept into the first fully-fledged ongoing horror title on the market, and did so with an air of professionalism that is exhibited in each of these stories and on the front of every one of these classic covers, creating a standard that had to be at least met or topped for any other horror book that actually wanted to compete at the newsstand. But ultimately, the story of horror comics had not even truly begun yet, as, in a way, the story of horror comic books is the story of EC Comics. As while they might not have started horror comics as Eerie did, 
The tradition of how horror comics would be understood and recognized began with EC. And how they ran their business influenced and impacted how horror comics would be handled for decades. And if EC Comics is the story of horror comics, then ultimately all of this is really the story of a legendary battle between two men. The repercussions of which would have lasting effects on art and culture for decades. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The company was founded by Max Gaines, who, after helping to develop some of the first color comic strips for Eastern Color Printing, would go on to found All American Publications, a comic company specializing in producing books and the new popular style of superheroes. Under his supervision, the company would bring to life iconic characters such as Wonder Woman, The Atom, Hawkman, Green Lantern, and The Flash. But his stake in the company would later be bought out by Harry Donenfield for half a million dollars in 1945, who was a co-publisher and founder at National Comics Publications. They would later, in 1977, officially change their name to DC Comics. With this money from selling off his share in those characters, he would then go on to form Educational Comics, or EC for short, that specialized in more wholesome material aimed directly at children, such as Dandy Comics, Animal Fables, The Happy Hands, Moon Girl, Picture Stories from Science, and Picture Stories from the Bible, to name a few. And while he was free to publish this type of wholesome content that he wanted to see on the market, that didn't mean that the audience was there willing to buy it. And starting out, EC Comics had essentially the lowest sales of all the functioning comic companies at the time. Max Gaines was, in a way, the father of comic books as we understand them today, as he was essentially the first person to take the comic strips that had been featured in newspapers and bundle them into a booklet to sell them separately for 10 cents at newsstands. He essentially played a hand in inventing the prototype of the comic book in 1934, and then continued to grow within the printing industry until he went on to found his own comic book company. And to him, I think, at that stage of his career, whether it was successful financially or not was a side note compared to the content of the books. But sadly, on August the 20th, 1947, Gaines was out boating on Lake Placid with his friend Sam Irwin, when they were struck by another boat going at high speeds, killing them both. And it was here that ownership of the company shifted into the hands of Max's 25-year-old son, William who had just finished going to school to be a chemistry teacher and had never intended to work in comics in the first place. The two, by all accounts, did not have a good relationship. Max was frequently verbally abusive to his son before he passed and didn't believe that he would amount to anything in life. And at such a young age, he had to now cope with the death of a parent and with little to no preparation, take this failing project that his father had tried to build that was already over $100,000 in debt and turn it around into a nationally successful brand. And under the advice of cartoonists Harvey Kurtzman and Al Feldstein, in trying to do this, he decided to take the company into a radically different direction. The Crypt of Terror and Vault of Horror were the first books in the new wave of the revolutionized EC Comics, but were soon followed up by titles like The Haunt of Fear and Crime Suspense Stories. And after just three issues, Crypt of Terror was rebranded as Tales from the Crypt. In addition to these, the company also hosted other horror-based content, including Weird Science, Weird Fantasy, Shock Suspense Stories, and Tales of Terror. They were geniuses at marketing. Their covers are still today recognizable on a shelf from across a room. And by the end of things, they had great gimmicks such as a line of stereoscopic 3D comics, they came with two 3D glasses so that you could share the book with a friend. The comic book industry doesn't have a particularly great track record when it comes to the way that artists are treated. In fact, one of the most prominent and creatively charged companies in all of media was formed by disgruntled artists who had grown frustrated by getting paid little to draw characters that they didn't own. But EC put their artists at the forefront and allowed them to do things that were unheard of at the other companies. Back then, and even still somewhat today, there was a concept called house style. Essentially, there was a particular way that Batman was supposed to always be drawn, and artistic flourishes were not encouraged. Another example of this is how, at least for a time, all Archie comics looked the exact same, no matter who was drawing them. In the 60s, Jack Kirby would sit new Marvel artists down and show them how particular characters were supposed to be done in accordance to their house style. Artists weren't allowed to sign their art, 
In fact, the art didn't actually even belong to them. Artists were seen as contract workers, creating content based on characters that they did not own for intellectual property holders. And since they did not own those characters in the eye of the law, they did not own the art that they were being contracted to create of those characters. Essentially meaning that all original copies of the pencil lines and ink work were retained by the comic book companies and not returned to the artists after the issue was released as they are now. So the potential income of creators was substantially limited because they didn't have the option to sell those original copies to collectors on the side. Neil Adams in a podcast with Kevin Smith tells a story of how he once personally witnessed an intern at DC shredding original art because they'd run out of room to store it in their main office. But things at EC were mostly different. They knew that each artist brought their own strengths and traits to the table and restricting them to a house style would in turn restrict the level of creativity that could possibly be achieved. Just look how these four drawings of the old witch differ from one another. They are all the same character, but each artist puts their own distinctive flair on the base design. Artists were actually allowed to sign their work now. The general philosophy was that if it was cool, it went in the book. Also with Crypt of Terror, you're starting out with just almost a shadowy illustration. You have the hair covering the face and just a hint of teeth and nose there. You're progressing to more of the face showing to a full face at the upper cover. Two years later, when you have Graham Ingalls and the whole series going full-fledged, you have his version of the witch here. Um, this isn't the Crypt Keeper, but the witch is similar in the vein with the witch coming down and his rendition, which is the most horrific in comics. It didn't matter anymore if there wasn't visual continuity for the characters in between issues. Artists were treated like superheroes or rock stars, put front and center for really the first time in the industry's history. At the time, it was even common for artists at other companies to not even be credited in the books that they drew. You would read a story and have no clue whose hand it came from, but that wasn't the case here. You can even find signatures on the covers for EC books. Every single issue of one of their comics had a biography on the inside cover of the many artists who worked for them. And if you read enough of their comics, you eventually learned about the personal lives of the entire staff that you were supporting with your money. Gaines knew that emotional connection to these creators would generate loyal readership. The price per page rate that artists were given was among the best out of all companies working at that time as well. Most artists received $50 per page completed, with an additional bonus on the back end if the issue sold well. And not only were artists given almost limitless freedom to draw what they wanted, but the writers were encouraged to write to an artist's strengths when constructing stories. If you were writing a Jack Davis story, you were suggested to add visceral violence into the script because that's where he excelled. Whereas if you were doing a George Evans story, mood was a more important factor in the tale. Just look at these different pages. The fact that they all came from the same company in the late 40s and early 50s to me is astounding. Within the next few years, because of EC success, you see a lot of iconic artists begin to come into their own with a lot of varying styles, including Al Feldstein, Tom Sutton, Jack Kamen, Gene Collin, Johnny Craig, Esteban Morato, Stephen R. Bissett, George Evans, Graham Ingalls, Jack Davis, John Tottlebin, Jose Gonzalez, Al Williamson, Wally Wood, Reed Crandall, Frank Frazetta, Alex Toth, Richard Corbin, Jose Ortiz, John Bolton, as well as many others. But it wasn't just the art that was revolutionary, as the writing at EC was actually about something. They told stories about social issues that we are still dealing with today, such as their story The Guilty from Shock Suspense Stories number 3, where a young, unarmed black man suspected of a crime is shot to death in the back by a sheriff without a trial. The story begins by saying, This shameful story might have taken place anywhere in the United States. It could have happened in your town. The story ends with the quote, Whether Aubrey Collins was innocent or guilty is not important. But for any American to have so little regard for the life and rights of any other American is a debasement of the principles of the Constitution upon which our country is founded. This was published in 1952. This was a big deal. 
The Whipping is about a man who is so furious at his daughter for dating a Hispanic man that he and the other men of the neighborhood dress in their clan robes and come for him in the night. They put him in a sack and beat him over and over again until he is dead, only to discover when they remove the sheet that they have killed his daughter instead, who they have grabbed in the darkness by mistake. Hate focuses on a man named John Smith. The narrator describes him as an American with a good American name a churchgoer, a family man, a respected member of the community. Today, John Smith learns who his new neighbors are going to be. And when he learns this, he walks across the street and he pins a note to their door that reads, don't move in Jew, you'll be sorry. We don't want Jews in this neighborhood. After this fails to scare them away, John and his neighbors begin to leave notes daily. They call the home and harass the family. But when this too does not work, one of the neighbors suggests further action. He says, why not? We tried to warn them nicely. We phoned them, we wrote them letters. Maybe if we beat them up, they'll sell and move. Otherwise, more will start showing up. And so they do just that, but the family still stays. The hate in their heart festers and their anger grows. And in the middle of the night, the men gather in the yard and burn the house to the ground with the family sleeping inside. The mother leaps from an upper window and breaks her neck when she lands in the yard. When he gets home, John's wife is distraught. He says, don't go soft, Mary. They were Jews. We don't want Jews. They're no good. John's mother in the other room overhears what has happened. And she comes to him and she tells him that she has kept a secret from him his entire life. She tells him he's not actually her son. Her husband, you see, had been a doctor and had late one night been called to the scene of an accident. A single mother had been pregnant and only the baby survived the crash and the doctor and his wife had taken that baby John into their family. She tells John that he is in fact Jewish himself. Through the window, the men overhear this and they no longer talk with him on their train commutes. They no longer have after work conversations on the lawn about their day. And then the letters start appearing on his door. And late one night, the men surround him and beat him just as John had beaten his neighbor before. The stories here would and could be read by children, yes, but they were really the first to start using the art form of comics to market to adults in America to communicate stories about real social issues going on in the country. Here is staff writer Al Feldstein talking just about that. What we were doing really was writing up to our readers. Uh, I was aware, having come out of the service, that there was a great uh, readership out there of older, older uh, adult, adults, older, not just teenagers, not just children, reading funny little animal books. But there were guys reading them in the barracks, and they were now back uh, in civilian life, and they were still reading comics. Don't forget, this was before television really had its impact. Early on in the tenure under Bill Gaines, it was common in the writing process at EC to borrow liberally from other sources. Gaines was an avid reader and was constantly looking everywhere for inspiration in the writings of popular contemporary horror authors that could help their comics stand out in the crowd. This was a practice that almost got them into severe legal trouble. When one day a letter from none other than Ray Bradbury arrived at their offices after it had come to his attention that they had ripped off two of his stories and he wanted compensation. His fairly sarcastic letter addressed to EC Comics editorial staff on April 12, 1952 read, Just a note to remind you of an oversight. You have not as yet sent on the check for $50 to cover the use of secondary rights on my two stories. Rocket Man and Kaleidoscope, which appear in your weird fantasy May June 52 with the cover all story of Home to Stay. I feel this was probably overlooked in the general confusion of office work, and I look forward to your payment in the near future. My very best wishes to you, yours cordially, Ray Bradbury. But instead of starting a fight with Bradbury, Gaines used the opportunity to open a conversation with him, and through that relationship, EC became the official home of Bradbury comic adaptations. Through his partnership with EC, they would work together on adapting another 26 of his short stories into comic book form. And the writing team would later say that it was through this partnership and studying and adapting Bradbury's writing that made them the strong comic writers that they themselves eventually became. As much as I love EC and what they started and what they did, as comics, there are some issues that hold them back from being my absolute favorite to read. Gaines had essentially no comic book experience before running the company. 
but he was a massive short story fan. And in some ways this shows when you read their books. He was a really talented guy who was just trying to do his best and this is in part what led the stories to being so remembered today. But to be honest, a lot of their books aren't the best examples of comic storytelling. They to me at times are a little bit overwritten and there are too many panels per page that squeeze the possible potential of the great artists they had working for them a little too tightly. The scripts at EC were written first and then lettered on paper before any of the drawing was ever started. And so often to me, the drawings feel a little cramped as the artists were trying to work around these pre-lettered bubbles. A lot of people when they start making comics, myself included, try to squeeze entire paragraphs into a panel and that just doesn't work from a storytelling or visual perspective. Comic books are a marriage of text and art and too many words can really overtake a page of comic book storytelling and bog the whole thing down. And as great as EC was, I think their comics were frequently guilty of this. When you compare them to other comics of the same time, they were already wordier than most comics are today and is probably one of the biggest complaints that you can hold against their work. But there is a trade-off there, as if a well thought out story with well written dialogue is primarily what you're concerned with within a comic, then these are absolutely the books for you. EC gave way to the new concept of horror host, an idea that was taken from radio horror dramas, in which a sinister voice would introduce each of the stories before they played out. The old witch was one of their creations, who hosted the comic The Haunt of Fear, and she was based on a similar radio witch heard here. And now, Satan, if everybody will just douse out them lights and make it nice and dark, we'll get right down to business. Draw up to the fire and gaze into them bugs. Gaze into them deep. And in bringing that idea to comics, they also created the Crypt Keeper and the Vault Keeper to host their other two popular titles. They are pretty much the most iconic idea that people associate with these early horror comics. Everyone knows who the Crypt Keeper is. And a great deal of horror comic anthologies from here on would use these types of outlandishly fun and evil characters to introduce their tales, such as Uncle Creepy, Dr. Death, who carries away souls, introducing stories by saying things like, no one knows when I may strike, from which hidden unsuspecting corner I may lurk at every tick of the clock. Every beat upon your heart. Cousin Eerie. Mr. L. Dead. Drusilla. Sabrina Spellman. Webster the Spider. Warden Fry. Misty. Dr. M.T. Graves. Vampirella. Headstone P. Gravely. Baron Werewolf. Winnie the Witch. Countess R. H. Blood, and Professor Coffin, as well as DC using characters like Death, Lucian, Cain, Abel, Destiny, Charity, The Mad Mod Witch, Square Shade, Mordred, Mildred, and Cynthia who would all later be repurposed by Neil Gaiman as mainstays of the Sandman universe. And as often comes with success, a number of copycat companies rise and fall in the early 1950s. These were essentially EC Comics in everything but name and sometimes talent, as in style they were all nearly identical, and that they were horror anthologies that packaged about four stories per issue, with most of them having horror hosts. It's a style that was developed in this time as a reaction to what EC was doing with their content and horror hosts that continues even today, influencing things from Creepshow to Goosebumps and The Twilight Zone. I thought back to the EC comics and how much I loved them and I tried to remember what it was about them that I loved so much. And I remembered that it was that amazing mix of horror and humor. There was always a funny twist. People were always making horrible puns about it. It was funny. And it's sort of what I try to do at a much gentler level in my books. Fawcett was one of these knockoff companies that was rising during this time that I am fond of. Publishing books such as This Magazine is Haunted, Terror Tales, Strange Suspense Stories, Unknown Worlds, and Worlds of Fear. 
The artwork that was done for their covers was amazing, and generally their stories tended to try and be more upsetting than gory or scary. The visuals of their brand were typically more nightmarish than a lot of the stuff on the market. They were very much doing the EC thing that many other companies were trying, with having a horror host paired with non-connected horror short stories in an anthology style. But they did it particularly well, in my opinion, compared to a lot of others. This Magazine is Haunted had a unique and sometimes cosmic identity to it. In the first issue, a man rises from the dead, and the townspeople run away in fear. One of them screams for everyone to look away, saying, He is of another world and not for our eyes to see. The man has the touch of death about him. He picks a few flowers and they wilt in his hands. He rubs the neck of a horse and it disintegrates into bone in a disturbing way. The Green Hands of Terror features disembodied limbs that choke in the night. The weirdest corpse of all time finds a widow who carries a small casket through the town while other townspeople look on at her in hatred. Her husband was an exterminator who hated his job. And one day when she was out at the store, the rats came and through magic they shrunk him and ate his flesh as revenge. And all she had to bury was his small remains. Comic Media is another standout company for horror here as well that operated for a short two years from 1952 to 1954 for reasons that will become obvious later. The covers on their book Horrific were some of the more unique of this time in my opinion, excluding a few that play into harmful racial caricatures. And this green cover featuring an ominous floating head is probably my favorite of this entire age of comics. Every time I see it, I want to know what he's looking at. The stories that they ran in their books were extremely intense and oftentimes quite trashy. But in retrospect, it's kind of fascinating to go back and look at them as products that were marketed directly to children, as they would be evidence that future critics would use against the comic book industry in the years to come. They were lurid tales frequently involving sexual desire, always were extremely graphic in content, and usually involved a plot focusing on Satan as an agent of chaos at some point in every issue. Don Heck was the main artist working for them at the time, who would later in 1955, after the company collapsed, be recruited by Stan Lee to work for Atlas Comics, and would go on to co-create Iron Man, Hawkeye, and Black Widow. He illustrated the insane story for comics media titled Hitler's Head, that involves a plot where Hitler rises from the pits of hell, now a minion for Satan, to haunt former SS officers who are no longer loyal to his evil cause. It starts with a flashback with Hitler who has gone mad with power, screaming at an officer, You have not killed enough. Your concentration camp reports have not been gory enough. Murder is what I ordered, I want more dead. It then cuts to that officer who has now gone into hiding in South America after the war, in a large abandoned castle with other ex-military officials. Deep in the cellar, the spirit of Hitler takes the form of a giant, floating version of his own head. And with an army of zombies at his disposal, he attacks the men and drags them to hell where they are forced to become new slaves to the devil. The Wrath of Satan is another story that they published, which is about Simon Fergus who used to own a traveling carnival before he was forced out of his shares and has had to take the only job that he can find, cleaning up trash at the carnival that he used to own just to support himself. Filled with a spirit of revenge, he summons Satan to his tent to gain his powers and causes the new carnival owner to die on the roller coaster, the rails of which being greased by Satan himself saying splendid, splendid revenge. In an attempt to trick the devil, he burns the contract that he has written with Satan, and as a result, his daughter turns into a hideous monster, causing him to die of a heart attack. Cadaver finds Carl Moreno, an attractive mortician with wonderful eyelashes, who is also a gold digger, dating a much older woman, who cuts off body parts from his cadavers and brings them to his new wife because of her desire to eat raw human meat. One day he brings her a hand to which she responds, Oh sweetheart, you're so good to me. You know I just love to chew on this type of meat. Here, I'll give you a kiss for it. In secret, Linda is his real love and she's totally fine with this arrangement because she is aware of the money he will inherit from his elderly cannibal wife. But she eventually grows tired of waiting and convinces Carl to try and kill her early with a poisoned human heart. But the dosage isn't enough, and she wakes up just as he's beginning to embalm her 
and out of shock and panic, he crushes her face with a hammer, only to then be haunted and eventually eaten by her ghost. Decapitation is about Homer Bobble, a man who has grown to hate his wife, who sits at home all day listening to game shows on the radio while eating constantly and getting bigger and bigger, which is slowly driving him insane. He waits for her to get home one day after going to the store with a fire poker behind his back. And as she enters the door, he smacks her in the forehead and ends her life. He drags her body outside to hide in the basement, in sheer glee, saying to himself, It's done, Homer Bobble. No more insane chatter. No more crazy quiz shows. No more Roberta. You don't mind a little rain, do you, Roberta darling? The garden path is the only way I can drag your fat carcass to the cellar. Moments later, while digging her grave in the basement, he says, Well, goodbye, my dear. Sweet dreams. This will be the last time I ever see you. No more arguments. No more cold meals. Just pure, delicious, heavenly quiet. A few days later, the mailman stops to deliver a letter addressed to Roberta, telling her that she has won a spot on a quiz show. And Homer decides to take the ticket for himself as a reward to try and win some riches to celebrate his newfound independence. But upon winning, the host pulls out his prize to reveal that it is the severed head of Roberta. And Homer realizes in shock that he is actually dead and that the game show host was Satan all along. And it is probably here that we should talk about some of the unsavory things that you have probably already noticed. And that these comics were very much about the imagined horrors of the world that threatened the status of white men. Their wealth is attacked, their masculinity, their place within the family structure as well as in society. Women existed in these stories to either bring down the potential of these men or to use their sexuality to destroy them. Stories about cannibals directly played into stereotypes within that subgenre of fiction. And evil gypsy curses were frequently found and functioned in the same way. And that is largely because of the people who are making these stories and the reality of what the climate of 1950s America was. These books, their covers and contents, and even the very advertisements between the stories are truly time capsules that give us a look into the psychology of that decade, representing the fears and prejudices of the primarily white male creators that were making these books at the time. And speaking of that, Lovecraft stories were also very popular to adapt in the golden age of horror comics, and is a trend that would continue into present day. In fact, comics media in their short run published at least two of them, Portal of Death, which adapted Pikmin's model, and Pit of Death that shows some Lovecraftian creatures found in a cave in Africa who do evil on the behalf of the devil. It's not a direct adaptation of any given story, but it clearly was inspired by his usual cosmic affair. And there were a ton of these that are fun to look at from all kinds of companies. EC Comics did a bunch themselves. The Vault of Horror adapted In the Vault and Cool Air, as well as mentioning Cthulhu in one tale. Weird Science would do their own reanimator twist that we talked about recently. Weird Fantasy would use the Necronomicon. Creepy would adapt the Rats in the Walls and Cool Air. Eerie with Wentworth's Day. Skull would do the Hound and also the Rats in the Walls. Heavy Metal would make the Dunwich Horror from Beyond and another version of the Rats in the Walls. Dell Comics would do the Color Out of Space. Marvel would eventually do a few of them as well, including The Terrible Old Man, the music of Eric Zahn. Pikmin's model, and the Shambler from the Stars. From the creation of EC Comics through the early to mid 1950s, horror and genre fiction in comic books would flourish, with different independent companies producing an absurd amount of titles in just a few years, such as Chamber of Chills, This Magazine is Haunted, The Thing, Strange Fantasy, Eerie, Slave Girl Comics, Strange Worlds, Witchcraft, City of the Living Dead, the Dead Who Walk, Diary of Horror, Phantom Witch Doctor, Night of Mystery, Secret Diary of Eerie Adventures, Adventures into the Unknown, Forbidden Worlds, Skeleton Hand, The Clutching Hand, Weird Adventures, Weird Thrillers, Eerie Adventures, Nightmare, Strange Terrors, Weird Horrors, Amazing Ghost Stories, 3D House of Terror, Ghost Comics, Monster, Ghostly Weird Stories, Spook, Detective Cases, Terrifying Tales, Terrors of the Jungle, Challenge of the Unknown, The Beyond, Web of Mystery, Hand of Fate, Witch's Tales, Black Cat Mystery, Thrills of Tomorrow, Captain Science, 
Beware, Dark Mysteries, Journey into Fear, Strange Mysteries, Mysteries Weird and Strange, Voodoo, Haunted Thrills, Fantastic Fears, Weird Tales of the Future, Weird Chills, Worlds Beyond, Worlds of Fear, This is Suspense, Tales of Horror, Purple Claw, The Unseen, Web of Evil, Intrigue, Weird Terror, Horrific, Horror from the Tomb, Mysterious Stories, and The Tormented. And that's not even close to all of them. I'm just trying to show you what a boom in this type of storytelling there was. And those are just the independent small publishers. The companies that would later become known as Marvel and DC were putting out books like Journey into Unknown Worlds, House of Mystery, Strange Tales, Uncanny Tales, Frankenstein, Menace, Amazing Mysteries, Suspense, Mystic, Astonishing, Space Worlds, Spellbound, Mystery Tales, and Journey into Mystery. It was a movement that totally captivated and took over the industry from the inside. The growth of horror in those companies is interesting to look at though, as even though they would eventually embrace horror on some titles, the shift into that was pretty gradual and shows the change in what was going on in popular comics at the time. Arguably the first horror title from one of the big two companies was Venus, but it didn't start out that way, not even close. Venus began in 1948 as a romance comic and stayed that way for its first eight issues. And starting with issue nine, the series shifted into being science fiction for the next eight issues. This was also where an early version of Loki would first appear within a Marvel comic. And then the genre would switch again to shift to horror for the last three issues of the run and would look really close to the style of book that EC was putting out. And to watch this change happen from August of 1948 to April of 1952 is pretty amazing because you can literally see on the page the influence that Gaines was building within the industry. Even comics that you wouldn't imagine being adjacent to horror would shift into that direction in these years, such as the short-lived Captain America's Weird Tales. One title that was an oddity here was Knights of Horror in 1954, which was written by an unknown writer who was only known by his pen name, Clancy, whose identity has still not been uncovered today and as well as an unknown artist. And while the identity of Clancy has never surfaced, it was discovered in 2004 that the artist for this book was none other than Joe Shuster, the co-creator of Superman. Even though he never signed his art, when you go back and compare the work that he did on that book and the work that he did on Knights of Horror, he might as well have. Knights of Horror, in my opinion, represents the most intense horror comic content that was produced in the 1950s. Even when looking at it today, a lot of these images are still pretty shocking. And part of that, I believe, is the strange mixture of this extreme adult content combined with that very identifiable and stylish 1950s look provided by Schuster. This wasn't his first entry into horror, as during the same time as their work on Superman nearly 20 years earlier, they created Dr. Occult, who was arguably the first horror-themed comic book character to ever appear in an American comic. He was at least the very first superhero horror character. But his reason for working on this book is pretty sad. The honest fact of the matter is that DC Comics has a pretty shady history behind itself. And part of that can be attributed to the fact that they should not own the rights to the character Superman. The character was co-created by Joe Shuster and Jerry Siegel when they were around the age of 19 years old. They tried shopping the character around to different comic book companies, including those owned by Max Gaines of EC Comics, but were turned down by all of them. Their money was running low and Harry Donenfield, who I mentioned earlier, Jack Leibowitz, and Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson offered them $130 for the first 13-page Superman story to run as a comic for their newly founded company, Detective Comics. This deal involved them signing the rights of their creation away, and thinking that this was normal business practice, they did so because they were low on money and wanted to see their creation in print. The three men would go on to make millions of dollars and build an internationally recognized brand off of something that they did not create. And Joe Shuster and Jerry Siegel would live in poverty for the rest of their lives. According to legend, Shuster was so broke in 1978 when Superman the movie was released that he couldn't even afford to see the film in theaters. The pair would later try and sue to regain the rights to their creation, which would only result in a small settlement and the ownership over the character of Superboy. 
in exchange for the two relinquishing all claims of possible ownership over the character of Superman, as well as claims that they even created the character. They no longer could even legally claim that the idea was theirs. So, cut to 1954 and Joe Shuster is not only living in poverty, while his creation has gone on to become an American icon and a symbol of justice, but he's also going blind. He couldn't find work anywhere and eventually took the only job he could find, drawing Knights of Horror. Knowing that he would get paid and hoping that the book would fly under the radar and disappear quickly, without anyone realizing that he made it. It was probably an embarrassing thing for him. He didn't sign his name to the work for a reason. According to secondhand information, the only place that Knights of Horror could be purchased was at seedy adults-only Times Square bookstores, but the circulation was probably a little bit larger than that. Seemingly unrelated to all of this, in early 1954, a group of four young men, Jack Koslaw, Melvin Mittman, Jerome Lieberman, and Robert Trachenberg, began a streak of crimes through Brooklyn that would earn them the name of the Brooklyn Thrill Killers. Over the course of several months, they assaulted several women, beat multiple homeless men for fun, and killed two in the process. During their trial, the psychologist working for the state, Dr. Frederick Wortham, received special permission from the judge to interview Coleslaw in private. And in this private interview, he learned that the young man was very obsessive over horror comic books. In their next session, Wortham brought him all 14 issues of Knights of Horror and asked if these were the types of comics that he was interested in, and he said they were. He also confirmed that the whip that he owned and used in one of the killings was ordered through an advertisement found in the back of the book. Dr. Wortham then publicly declared that Knights of Horror was directly responsible for the Thrill Kill Gang's activities, and that these crimes would not have happened had the boys not been introduced to horror comic books. Dr. Frederick Wortham had been slowly dipping his toes into the persecution of comic book creators for several years now. In early 1948, he participated in a public symposium with other mental health professionals called the Psychopathology of Comic Books. And based on his involvement with that panel, he was then subsequently interviewed for Judith Christ's infamous piece for Collier Magazine, titled Horror in the Nursery, in March of that same year. I hate this article. And it really was one of the seminal works in turning public perception on comics. It begins with a quote from a child that Wortham personally interviewed. He says, My sister always likes to play the handsome man. I like to play the crook or the cop. She lots of times plays an actress getting captured. We used to make her walk along the street. Then we used to come and take her into the playroom and tie her up. And then we go sit at the table and make plans of how to get rid of her. In the meantime, she is trying to escape. And I really detest this perversion of normal behavior. When I was a kid in daycare after school, we would frequently tie somebody to a tree, or I was tied to a tree, or put into a fake jail, or banished to a corner of a room that was representative of some shadow dimension, as part of the rules of a similar childhood game of make-believe. I distinctly remember that. Only it was the late 90s, so we were pretending to be Dragon Ball characters instead of cops and robbers. It's just something that kids do, and isn't representative of some underlying mental depravity that is sweeping across the nation that needs to be stopped. And to pretend that that is the case at the very beginning of an article shows its inherent bias and intent on harming an industry that was mostly supplying harmless fun and creating jobs for hundreds of artists. Also, I would like to point out that they definitely tied up a kid for this photo session to be published with this article, which is way worse than anything that they were arguing against. The piece is filled with a lot of insane fear-mongering. Claims that 9 out of 10 American households are in danger of the horrible effects that comics can have. That it isn't only delinquent kids that can be affected. That many current murder cases can be traced back to a childhood exposure of horror comic books and movies. The most ominous quote featured here would be very much prophetic of what was to come for both Frederick Wortham and the comic book industry in the next few years. As he tells Judith Chris that, if those responsible refuse to clean up the comic book market, and to all appearances, most of them do, the time has come to legislate these books off the newsstands and out of the candy stores. In 1954, in the lead up to this trial, Wortham would also publish an article titled What Parents Don't Know About Comic Books in Ladies Home Journal. He starts here by suggesting that even if you think what you know your kids are reading, you are probably wrong. He is literally attempting to gaslight people who do review the material that they let their children look at. As he says, many adults think they know all about crime comic books because they know mystery and detective novels, comic strips in newspapers, 
and have cast an occasional glance at a comic book at a newsstand or in a child's hand. But most adults really have no idea of the details and content of the majority of crime comic books. He says that juvenile delinquency has increased by 20% in just two years. Threatens that if nothing is done about comics, then these numbers will only continue to rise. He essentially argues that this is the pathway leading to a clockwork orange-like society, where roving gangs of delinquents rule the night in cities. And at the very end here, he for the first time makes the main argument against comics that he would repeat many times in the years to come, when he says, The average parent has no idea that every imaginable crime is described in detail in comic books. That is their main stock in trade. If one were to set out to teach children how to steal, rob, lie, cheat, assault, and break into candy stores, no more instant method could be devised. It is of course easy and natural for the child to translate these comics into a minor key. Stealing from a candy store instead of breaking into a bank. Stabbing and hurting a little girl with a sharp pin if a knife is not handy. Throwing stones into the windows of trains and cars instead of payroll robberies and holdups. Beating and threatening younger children instead of Superman heroics. Following a simple formula of older child against younger child instead of Superman against man. This trial that became attributed to the publication of Knights of Horror would be the first in several comic book legal battles that Dr. Frederick Wortham would find himself directly involved with. He convinced Adrian Paul Burke, who worked with the Cooperation Council out of the mayor of New York's office, that something had to be done about this. And a court order was written that allowed five Times Square bookshops to be raided and all of their Knights of Horror copies taken and destroyed. The police commissioner of New York agreed with Wortham and was quoted at the time as saying, It is the informed opinion of these police officials that there is a definite relationship between the types of crime portrayed in Knights of Horror and similar works and the crimes of sex and violence which beset the city of New York today. Kingsley Books sued the mayor's office and the case that would be known as Kingsley Books Inc. versus Brown went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. They would finally vote in January of 1957, and they would rule that Kingsley Books did in fact distribute obscene material and would have to face both criminal and financial charges on that. A decision that would set precedence and restrict not only comics, but also other forms of adult content for years to come. The court would order all copies of Knights of Horror that would be found in the future to be destroyed, resulting in almost none still existing today. If you are ever to find one, it will almost certainly be in bad condition, while also listed for hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Tensions had been building around comics for a long time in the country, but it started mostly on the fringe and became more mainstream as it continued. Novelist Sterling North in 1940 wrote an article titled A National Disgrace that circulated almost every major newspaper in the country, where he describes the new art form as a poisonous mushroom growth of the last two years. He says, 10 million copies of these sex horror serials are sold every month. One million dollars are taken from the pockets of America's children in exchange for graphic insanity. He goes on to claim that the printing quality of these books is so cheap and poorly done that the very act of reading them can cause damage to the eyes and central nervous system. They were attacking the crime comics, which preceded me. They were attacking Superman uh, back in the 30s and 40s because uh, some kid might think he could fly and jump off the roof. Um, they attacked comic books because you couldn't read the print and it was ruining all the kids' eyes. They came up with more damn reasons to attack comics over the years. Uh, it's really kind of ludicrous when you look back. But as we all know or have learned recently, when the fringe say things that are unscientific enough times, people start to believe it. The National Congress of Parents and Teachers began mailing in the early 40s copies of the North editorial to all forms of government officials in mass. And this snowballed into other articles being published by more reputable sources and was a movement and conversation that slowly grew for a decade. Here is Orson Welles at the time answering a question completely unrelated to the film that he was trying to promote, about how he felt horror comics affected the nation's youth. I don't think that horror films or horror comics contribute to juvenile delinquency. I think that they may encourage psychotics and homicidal and other dangerous types but juvenile delinquency is, a, I think, a symptom of the illness of our age. It doesn't come from lack of playgrounds or bad comic books. 
but of a great longing for youth to have something to rebel against. Harvey Comics would also change their traditional business practices and begin in the early 50s to get into the horror game. Founded in 1941, Harvey was primarily known for being a company that distributed stories of intellectual properties for other media. They did Casper Comics, as well as Felix the Cat, Mutt and Jeff, Richie Rich, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and Little Audrey. And at this time, they primarily focused on a variety of romance comics. But starting in 1951, they would start to publish a line of horror books that mimic the style of the time by having collections of horror short stories occasionally presented by a horror host, as was the case with their book, The Man in Black. Throughout the early 50s, they would publish titles such as Alarming Tales, Chamber of Chills, Jungle Terror, Front Page, Thrills of Tomorrow, Tomb of Terror, and Witch's Tales. As horror comics continued to rise massively after EC Comics revolutionized the business in 1948, Frederick Wortham continued his campaign to try his damnedest to ruin it all, and for a great many, he did. His influence was growing. His writings could be found in popular mainstream publications, such as Time Magazine and Reader's Digest. His involvement in several prominent trials was making him a household name around the country. He was a man with a background that could be trusted who was confirming the illogical fears that a lot of people had. In 1954, when speaking in front of Congress, Wortham would describe his professional background as follows. I have practiced psychiatry and neurology since 1922. I taught psychiatry and brain pathology and worked in clinics at the John Hopkins Medical School from 1922 to 1929. In 1929, I was the first psychiatrist to be awarded a fellowship by the National Research Council to do research on the brain. Some part of my research at the time was on paresis and brain syphilis. It came in good stead when I came to study comic books. From 1932 to 1952, I was senior psychiatrist at the New York City Department of Hospitals. I was first in charge of the psychiatric clinic of the Court of General Sessions, examining convicted felons, making reports to the court. In 1936, I was appointed director to the Mental Hygiene Clinic in Bellevue. In 1939, I was appointed director of psychiatric services at the Mental Hygiene Clinic at Queens General Hospital. In 1946, I organized and started the first psychiatric clinic in Harlem, a volunteer staff. A few years later, I organized the Quaker Emergency Mental Hygiene Clinic, which functioned as a clinic for the treatment of sex offenders under the Magistrates Court of New York. Frederick Wortham was an educated man that was well-trusted by most who advocated for good in his life. He was an important figure in Brown versus Board of Education, arguing against segregation in schools providing scientific evidence proving that segregation was bad for the mental well-being of children. He always advocated for doing right by people and worked to provide mental health services to poor areas at little to no cost. Like, even though I really don't like him, I have to admit that he did a lot of good in his life that benefited a lot of people. He is generally painted as a villain in history, and I don't really want to add to that. Because in a way he was when it comes to comic books. But if you look at his life as a whole, he's a really complex figure that's hard to sum up. His work had a tactile effect on history that we are still feeling today, that generated both tremendous good and tremendous harm. After his initial success on the public stage, he continually poked his nose into things that he didn't really belong in for personal fame, in the name of public health. Creating problems for people who weren't actually doing any wrong. He famously debated Alfred Hitchcock about the level of violence present in his films. And even though I disagree with pretty much everything that he ever did in regards to comics, to some degree I have to look at things from his perspective. Not that I think it was a bad thing or that it was causing some sort of great harm to the nation's youth, but it is an undeniable fact that comic books were becoming more and more salacious with each passing year. Covers were competing with each other, and as a result, they were becoming more vulgar and shocking to sell copies. This cover to Lawbreaker's Suspense Stories is a really scary short story unto itself, where a man corners a woman with a bloody knife and a handful of flesh, saying, I know you are a mute, Miss Kimberly, but even if you could yell, the people downstairs couldn't call the police. You see, I already cut all their tongues out. Tomb of Terror 15 had a zombie's head exploding on the cover. Ghost Comics number 6 had very strong implications. Weird Mysteries had brain extractions and shrunken heads being pulled out of hats like rabbits. Astonishing number 30 had a man being melted by lasers shooting from giant eyes. Witch's Tale had a bell being rung by a head. Fantastic Fears 6 had this guy. 
and Black Cat 50 has a man disintegrating from radiation. Now, I don't have a problem with most of this, and I think it's a time of particular genre creativity. But I could see someone being upset if their kids saw this on a newsstand, let alone if they were allowed to purchase it and read it without their permission. I love the horror comics of the 1940s and early 1950s, but there's no doubt that a story like Caterpillar House would have really disturbed me when I was a kid. As a parent, how could you not get upset at the hypocrisy of it all when you see your child reading a story like The Corpse That Came to Dinner that has art like this paired with it and a disclaimer at the bottom of the page saying that this magazine is guaranteed wholesome reading. So while I'm upset at how the public reacted to horror comics and rallied around the writing of Dr. Wortham, I also kind of get it. I would argue that April 21st, 1954 was the most important single day in comic book history, in which, after a large public outcry, the leaders of the comic book industry, primarily those involved in the creation of horror comic books, were brought before the United States Senate to justify their business practices. In the lead up to this, in order to further capitalize off of the hysteria and to call for further action to be taken by public officials, Dr. Wortham published the work that he would become most known for, Seduction of the Innocent, a nearly 400-page essay on the dangers of comic books. In my opinion, this book was one of the most significant attacks on the rights to free speech in American history, and had long-lasting damage that we are still seeing the effects of today. But not only does he vehemently attack horror comics, he is also against all forms of comics in general. He is clinically obsessive with the sexuality of comic books, implies that Wonder Woman's power and independence makes her comic a lesbian story with BDSM undertones. He calls Superman the ideal fascist superhero, which is probably the only point that he's somewhat correct on. But he perceives things constantly that aren't actually there to prove points that only he was trying to make. He reads way too far into the Freudian sexuality of what he believes lies just below the ink on every page and under every panel. Such as starting the long-lasting narrative that is still joked about to this day about Batman and Robin being a latently gay comic in a negative way. He writes, The Batman type of story may stimulate children to homosexual fantasies, of the nature of which they may be unconscious. Robin is a handsome, ethabic boy, usually shown in his uniform with bare legs. He is buoyant with energy, and devoted to nothing on Earth, or an interplanetary space, as much as to Bruce Wayne. He often stands with his legs spread, the genital region discreetly evident. I genuinely believe that only a weirdly obsessive and out-of-touch person looking to do harm would write that and think that it sounded reasonable or sane. And his involvement in the crusade against comics led to a lot of different comic publications featuring him over the next few decades. In this issue of Suspense, you can find a horror story about Wortham titled The Raving Maniac which is just great. It involves a man bursting into a comic editor's office to accuse them of outlandish things. And you can tell that this was just an act of cathartic wish fulfillment on their part. The editor even gets to slap Wortham at one point so hard that his hat flies off. He pushes him in a chair and forces him to read the daily headlines, and says that horror fiction is a release and escape from the real horrors of the world that can be found on the front pages every day, and that horror fiction never actually hurt anybody like real life horror did. At the end of the story, two men in white coats burst into the room, and they introduce themselves as doctors who work at the local mental institution. And they say that this man has escaped from their hospital and that they have been hunting him for two days. The editor, at the end of his day, goes home to his family, and before bed, he reads a story to his daughter before tucking her in to sleep. This would be the last issue of Suspense, as they would be run out of business by Frederick Wortham soon after. He would also appear in the 1973 magazine Scream, in issue 104 of Jungle Comics, the main villain is named Wortham, and he's pushed off a boat and subsequently eaten by a cougar. Years later, Blab No. 3 would feature cartoons of Wortham in a comic described on the title page as providing an abridged version of the book that neutered the comic book industry. This even continues today, as about a decade ago, Grave Tales ran a story titled Frederick Wortham Goes to Hell. He is still today, 70 years later, a very hated figure. As much as I think that Will Gaines was a brilliant comic book creator, and was pretty much correct in everything that he said during these attacks on comics, he was not a brilliant strategist. Just because you have a large audience, doesn't mean that it's a very good idea to ever try and weaponize them for a cause. And it is usually also a bad idea to publicly mock your opponent, especially if that opponent is the United States Senate, who were threatening investigations into the comic book companies and their top psychiatrist. 
And this is exactly what he tried to do. As out of a reaction of anger and probably fear in 1954, he first had political cartoons of Frederick Wortham run in Mad Magazine, where he renamed him Dr. Worthless. And then he had every single EC comic book published with this letter that he wrote titled, Are You a Red Dupe? as the opening page. It reads as follows. In the town of Gazuki, in the heart of Soviet Russia, young Melvin Bazunkan Shkovitsky published a comic magazine. So they came and smashed his four-color press and hung poor Melvin the next morning. Here in America, we can still publish comic magazines, newspapers, slicks, books, and the Bible. We don't have to send them to a censor first. Not yet. For there are some people in America who would like to censor, who would like to suppress comics. It isn't that they don't like comics for them, it's that they don't like comics for you. These people say that comic books aren't good for children, as no comic books or something like that. Some of these people are no-goods, some of these people are do-gooders, some are well-meaning, and some are just plain mean. But we are concerned with an amazing revelation. After much searching of newspaper files, we've made an astonishing discovery. The group most anxious to destroy comics are the communists. We're serious, no kidding. Here, read this. The Communist Daily Worker of July 13th, 1953 said that comics play a conscious role of brutalizing American youth, the better to prepare them for the military service in implementing our government's aims of world domination and to accept the atrocities now being perpetrated by American soldiers and airmen in Korea under the flag of the United Nations. The article also quotes Gershon Legman, who claims to be a ghostwriter for Frederick Wortham, the author of the most recent blast against comics, published in the Ladies' Home Journal. This same G. Legman in issue 3 of Neurotica, published in autumn of 1948, said, The child's natural character must be distorted to fit civilization. Fantasy violence will paralyze his resistance, divert his aggression to unreal enemies and frustrations, and in this way prevent him from rebelling against parents and teachers. This will siphon off his resistance to society and prevent revolution. So the next time some joker gets up at a PTA meeting or starts jabbering about the naughty comic books at your local candy store, give him the once over. We're not saying he's a communist. He may be innocent of the whole thing. He may be a dupe. He may not even read the Daily Worker. It's just that he swallowed the red bait. Hook, line, and sinker. Years later, Gaines would regret this letter and acknowledge that it was a mistake, that this was the real beginning of the end for his career especially in that he didn't tell Jack Davis, who provided the three panels at the top of the letter, the context of what he was drawing. He would say on the matter, I had a very good friend who used to amuse himself by going around until he found somebody haranguing a crowd on the street. And let's say he would size the guy up as a right winger. He found that if he went over and said, you're a communist, the guy would be incensed because he hates communists and somebody's calling him a communist. And it's the worst thing in the world you could call him. Well, I took this thing and said, well, number one, everyone who's against my comics is a right winger. And if I call them a communist, they'll be furious. The title was, Are You a Red Dupe? And poor old Davis, he probably never read it, drew it to his eternal dishonor. And that was it. It was one of my dumber things. In the background to all of this, we have Estes Kafafer, who was a longstanding senator from Tennessee. And he was primarily known for his tough stance on the mob and organized crime violence. And he knew that the public discourse and outcry that was building around comics that Frederick Wortham had stirred presented a potential opportunity to go after the publishing holdings that the mob had, as it was an open secret that they had strong connections to the distribution of newspapers, comic books, and magazines all over the country. And so in order to further his political ambitions of a future presidential run, he played a significant part in scheduling a Senate hearing to be held for three days in New York, beginning on April 21st, to investigate horror comic books in the hopes of getting governmental control over the distribution process that the Mafia was in power over. And he invited Frederick Wortham to deliver a key testimony. These comic book covers that you are seeing here are a sample of what the children of the United States are reading today. 20 million copies of these comic books are pouring off the presses every single month. They are getting into the hands of children and their contents match the covers. They are full of crime, terror, and horror. The Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency had as a prime witness uh, Wortham. 
Now, as soon as I heard this thing was formed, I asked for permission to appear. It was one of the first public hearings ever broadcast live nationally on television. The day began at 10 in the morning. Senator Hendrickson was set to preside over the hearings, with Senators Kefauver and Hennings also in attendance on the panel. Appearing alongside them was Chief Counsel Herbert J. Hannock, Associate Chief Counsel Herbert Wilson Beezer, and the Executive Office of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Richard Clendenin. The opening line spoken by Chairman Hendrickson laid out the tone in which the hearings would imbue. This meeting of the Senate subcommittee investigating juvenile delinquency will now be in order. Today and tomorrow, the United States subcommittee investigating juvenile delinquency, of which I am the chairman, is going into the problem of horror and crime comic books. By comic books, we mean pamphlets illustrating stories depicting crimes or dealing with horror and sadism. We shall not be talking about the comic strips that appear daily in most of our newspapers. Dr. Harris Peck, who served as the director of the Bureau of Mental Health Services for New York City, would be brought in as an introductory speaker to prime the proceedings of the day. And while he did not outright condemn comics, he did not praise them either, and stated that many of the troubled children that became wards of the state under his supervision were, in his own words, quite preoccupied with the materials of the kinds of comic books that were shown here this morning. Henry Edward Schultz would be the next to speak, he served as the primary attorney for the Association of Comic Book Publishers. His main purpose of being invited to speak at the panel was to present the history of the first comic book advisory code that attempted to regulate the content of comics, which ultimately was ignored by pretty much everyone. He explains that the original code was written seven years previously, and it wasn't until four years before these hearings that William Gaines changed the industry with the EC Horror Comics. He said that it is impossible to say that the EC comics truly follow the already existing guides, because the guide couldn't predict the emergence of horror comics. Gaines was technically following the code because there wasn't anything written in the code that prevented him from doing what he was doing, because nobody at the time of writing it thought that publishers would sink to this level of violence in their comics. He essentially argues that Gaines is operating without any oversight that he can currently do whatever he feels like without breaking any publishing laws, but doesn't go so far as to condemn the movement of horror within comics that Gaines had been leading. With the opening statements concluded, William Gaines was supposed to speak next, as the first official guest of the hearings. His testimony was written with that in mind. But the committee agreed to first take an unscheduled lunch break, and in that time, Dr. Wortham arrived for his testimony, that was scheduled to be after Gaines's. Because the doctor's schedule was limited, the senators decided to postpone Gaines's testimony and allow Wortham to speak first, which adversely affected the statement that Gaines had prepared, but upon objecting to this, he was overruled and forced to go second. Dr. Wortham finally took the stand around 2 p.m., when the session reconvened after the long lunch break. The chairman, Hendrickson, swore him in, and then the doctor laid out his argument clinically, in four very logical steps, including evidence, statistics, financial records, and results from scientifically conducted studies that he had personally run on different groups of children as to why comics should be banned from major retailers and made illegal to be sold to children. The structure of his argument was 1. What is the content of comic books aimed at children? 2. Are there bad effects of comic books? 3. How far reaching are these bad effects? And 4. Is there a remedy? What follows are the key, most important quotes from his 25-minute testimony. If it were my task, Mr. Chairman, to teach children delinquency, to teach them how to rape and seduce girls, how to hurt people, how to break into stores, how to cheat, how to forge, how to do any known crime, if it were my task to teach them that, I would have to enlist the crime comic book industry. Nobody would believe that you teach a boy homosexuality without introducing him to it. The same thing with crime. My opinion is based on clinical investigations which I started in the winter of 1945 and 1946. They were carried out not by me alone, but with the help of a group of associates, psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, social workers, psychiatric social workers, remedial reading teachers, probation officers, and others. This research was a sober, painstaking, laborious clinical study 
And in some cases, since it has now been going on for seven years, we've had a chance to follow for several years. There arises the question, what kind of child is affected? I say again without any reasonable doubt and based on hundreds and hundreds of cases of all kinds, that it is primarily the normal child. Mr. Chairman, American children are wonderful children, if we give them a chance to act right. It is senseless to say that all these people who get into some kind of trouble with the law must be abnormal, or there must be something wrong with them. As a matter of fact, the most morbid children that we have seen are the ones who are less affected by comic books, because they are wrapped up in their own fantasies. Now the question arises, and we have debated it in our group very often and very long, why does the normal child spend so much time with this smut and trash? We have this baseball game which I would like you to scrutinize in detail. They play baseball with a dead man's head. Why do they do that? This is a baseball game where they play baseball with a man's head. Where the man's intestines are the baseline. All his organs have some part to play. The torso of this man is the chest protector of one of the players. There is nothing left to anybody's morbid imagination. I think Hitler was a beginner compared to the comic book industry. They get the children much younger. They teach them race hatred at the age of four before they can read. If the children see these kinds of things over and over, they can't go to the dentist. They can't go to a clinic. They can't go to a ward in a hospital. Everywhere they see this where women are beaten up, where people are shot and killed. And finally they become, as St. Augustine said, unconsciously delighted. I don't blame them. I try to defend them, or I try to understand them. Mr. Chairman, as long as the crime comic book industry exists in its present form, there are no secure homes. You cannot resist infantile paralysis in your own home alone. Must you not take into account the neighbor's children? I would like to point out to you one other crime comic book, which we found to be particularly injurious to the ethical development of children, and those are the Superman comic books. They arouse in children fantasies of sadistic joy in seeing other people punished over and over again, while you yourself remain immune. We have called it the Superman Complex. In these comic books, the crime is always real, and the Superman's triumph over good is unreal. Moreover, these books, like any other, teach complete contempt of the police. We have found, and in response to questions, I will be glad to get into that, we have found all comic books have a very bad effect on teaching the youngest children the proper reading technique, to learn to read from left to right. This balloon print pattern prevents that. So many children, we say they read comic books, they don't read comic books at all. They look at pictures and every once in a while, as one boy expressed it to me, when they get the woman or kill the man, I try and read a few words. But in any of these stories, you don't have to have any words. There is no doubt this is blood and the man is being killed. There is no doubt what they're going to do to this girl. You know too. In other words, the reading is very much interfered with. Now, what about the remedy? Mr. Chairman, I am just a doctor. I can't tell what the remedy is. I can only say that in my opinion, this is a public health problem. I think it ought to be possible to determine once and for all what is in these comic books. And I think it ought to be possible to keep the children under 15 from seeing them displayed to them, and preventing these being sold directly to children. In other words, I think something should be done to see these children can't get them. You see, if a father wants to go into a store and says, I have a little boy of seven. He doesn't know how to rape a girl. He doesn't know how to rob a store. Please, sell me one of your comic books. Let the man sell him one. But I don't think the boy should be able to go see this rape on the cover and buy the comic book. I think from a public health point of view, something must be done now, Mr. Chairman. William Gaines was the next to speak. He would later say, when looking back on it, that his doctor had recently placed him on a new diet medication, and that he planned his meals and medication based on the idea that he would be speaking in the morning and not around 3 p.m. He would later say about this, At the beginning, I was really going to fix those bastards. But as time went on, I could feel myself fading away. They were pelting me with questions, and I couldn't locate the answers. I am a comic magazine publisher. My group is known as EC, Entertaining Comics. I am here as a voluntary witness. I asked for and was given this chance to be heard. I publish horror comics. I was the first publisher in these United States to publish horror comics. I'm responsible. I started them. 
Some may not like them. That's a matter of personal taste. It would be just as difficult to explain the harmless thrill of a horror story to a Dr. Wortham as it would be to explain the sublimity of love to a frigid old maid. What are we afraid of? Are we afraid of our own children? Do we forget that they are citizens too and entitled to the essential freedom to read? Or do we think our children so evil, so vicious, so simple-minded that it takes but a comic magazine story of murder to set them to murder, of robbery to set them to robbery? Gaines's main argument was primarily that people of all ages love horror, and that people have, if you will, always enjoyed telling each other spooky stories around the fire. And he says that as long as it was done within good taste, then where is the issue? At this, Senator Kefauver reached into an envelope and produced this comic, Crime Suspense Stories number 22. He said, here is your May 22 issue. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has just been severed from her body. Do you think that this is in good taste? Gaines paused for a moment and thought, and then he said, Yes sir, I do, for a cover of a horror comic. A cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding the head a little higher so that the neck could be seen dripping blood from it, and moving her body a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. You have blood coming out of her mouth. A little. I think William Gaines' testimony is pretty much the single most important individual moment in comic book history, and one of the most important anti-censorship moments in United States history. If you like horror comics, if you like horror movies, if you like to make art, if you like to write, if you work in films or games based around horror, then in my opinion you and I both have Bill Gaines and people like Bill Gaines to thank for that who stood against opposition and argued for people's rights to create what they love, so long as no one is being directly harmed by it. This channel wouldn't exist if it weren't for the many people like that, and I'm constantly gracious for the work of those who came before me. But as I mentioned a moment ago, I don't think that Bill Gaines was a brilliant strategist. And while he was standing up and looking out for the protection of all of our rights, he wasn't very good at looking out for himself. The next day, the New York Times front page read, No harm in horror comic issuer says. Comic publisher sees no harm in horror, discounts good taste. A subheading within that article reads, I started horror. The public perception of the events and the way that they were to be directed by the news media was clear. And not only had the blame shifted directly onto the creators of comic books for making and distributing this kind of content, but now the public had a face that could represent this idea in their mind. I'm going to link to the transcript for Gaines's testimony at the bottom of this video. And even though it's kind of long, I would recommend reading through it to really get a clear idea of how crazy this hearing really was. And what I think is so tragic about reading Gaines' testimony is that somewhere in the middle you can tell pretty much the exact moment that he realizes that he's lost. At one point he openly admits that he came underprepared, expecting other doctors besides Frederick Wortham who were more qualified in the Department of Mental Health than he was who were to speak later in that day to present evidence in his favor, which did not happen. I think one of the things that led to his downfall was a false sense of optimism in other people and trust that the government would eventually do the right thing when it came down to it. All of our testimony from psychiatrists and uh, children themselves uh, show that it's uh, very upsetting, that it has a bad moral effect, and that it is directly responsible for a substantial amount of juvenile delinquency and child crime. Over the next two days, Senator Kefauver brought forth an array of people to specifically build a constructed legal argument against Bill Gaines and the horror comic book community. The executive director of the Child Studies Association of America, William Reichter, who worked to ban comics through the News Dealer Association of New York, the chairman of the New York State Joint Legislative Community to study the publication of comics. Ed Fulton, who was a member of the House of Commons in Canada, who successfully passed laws there banning horror comics. The chairman of the Juvenile Delinquency Committee of the Union County Bar Association. They even dragged Samuel Roth out of prison to come speak, who had been arrested for distributing obscene material. And by speak, I mean they brought him in to stand there while they demeaned him in front of the entire country, live on national television. His case would eventually go before the Supreme Court, and they would rule against him, and his trial would further set into law that obscenity was not protected under free speech in the Constitution. Ultimately, Gaines rose to the occasion but failed to recognize the threat that his enemy really possessed. 
And in the discussion of a single cover of a single comic book, entertainment history was changed forever. And the thing that is really sad and frustrating to me about all of this is that the entire event that lasted for three days was centered around the concept of juvenile delinquency. But there was not a single young person that was allowed to speak at the hearing. And the young people who were the largest audience that read comics were the ones who were most greatly affected by all of this, second only to the hundreds of artists whose jobs were on the line. Letters were written from all over the country, trying to get senators to listen to them, but none of them were taken seriously. Their voices were not heard then, but I think they should be now, as the argument that was made then about comic books continues today about other forms of media. And also video games. I'm hearing more and more people say the level of violence on video games is really shaping young people's thoughts. And then you go the further step, and that's the movies. You see these movies, they're so violent, and yet a kid is able to see the movie if sex isn't involved. One such letter dated June 4th, 1954 reads, Dear Sir, I have been reading comic books for seven to nine years. Every kind of book that was written. I have never robbed a bank or things like that. My personal opinion is, I think, reading comic books makes a young or old person not want to commit a crime. Because in every story, the saying crime doesn't pay is carried out. The person or persons committing the crime are always caught. The fear of this stops crimes and stops juvenile delinquency. In fact, there is not a sufficient number of comic books on the book stands. I am 14 years old. Thank you, Robert Murdian. I don't think the events of these three days and the repercussions is something that Gaines ever truly got over. Here he is almost 40 years later in 1991, a little over a year before he passed away, looking back on the hearings and what transpired on that day. So in any case, a Senate subcommittee is convened to uh, investigate juvenile delinquency. And part of this investigation, and it must be kept in mind, this is coincident with the McCarthy era. It was a little after. Oh, the era, yes. Yeah. Well, in any case, they're looking into juvenile delinquency, and they're concerned enough about the horror magazine industry to call you as a witness. What do you recall about the exchange? Well, <laughs> uh, first I read a statement, which I was up all night writing with Lyle Stewart, my friend, and uh, uh, I, I went there and read the statement, and then they questioned me. Um, and it wasn't just horror comics, they really were after all comics, virtually all comics. But uh, mine were the best or the worst, depending on your look at, uh, how you look at it, of all the comics. And so I guess I was the star witness. Uh, their contention was that uh, all comics, almost all comics, uh, uh, lead to juvenile delinquency. They're bad for the children. Uh, they even came up with things like it's bad for their eyes, uh, which, which wasn't true because most of the lettering was very well done by professional letterers. Uh, they, they were just out to get us, and they did a good job. Did but, they have a point, though, at least in part, did they have a point? If there were uh, episodes about cannibalism or whatever, might that have had some sort of negative effect on impressionable young minds? I have never believed that. I still don't believe it. The stuff that they have in movies and television today is so much worse than anything I ever put out, and I can't see that that ever harmed anybody either. Kids love horror. They love gore. They love all these dreadful things. I have a grandson who just eats this stuff up, and he's about five years old, and all he could do is wait for the reprints of my comics because he loves them. Some of the exchange didn't go so well for you. In parts of, of, a lot of it, in parts of so it well you were brilliant <laughs> and eloquent and effective. And here is where we're going to leave it for today. But if you like this, then I ask you to please come back next time. And we're going to see the outcomes from all of this. And how these events affected the lives of artists, creators, and loyal readers for decades. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you then. No, no. You may
talk a bit. It all depends on you. I know, I know, because I. 